Aloha, and welcome to the 18th uh, Pythagorean Order of Death podcast, or the POD podcast. Uh, this will be the uh, 18th time that I've done this. I'm, as always, your host, Reverend Jonathan Barlow G., and I'll be answering questions now from again Andrus Lux, a longtime questioner of the brand and so forth. Uh, and as before, uh, with the background being the indicating clue, uh, tonight I'll be discussing. Questions from Andrus on the Pythagorean order of death material itself. So it'll be the fifth installment of uh, me talking to Andrus about the POD material in specific. And that's about it. So let's get straight to it. The law of threes. Ein, Ein Sof, Ein Sof are. What are they exactly? In the context of Kabbalah, where these ideas originate, traditionally Ein, meaning zero or nothingness, Ein Sof, called limitless nothingness, and Ein Sof or, called bright, limitless nothingness, are the layers above and beyond the uppermost Sephirot emanation on the Tree of Life diagram over Kether, the crown. In the context of the Law of Threes, these concepts correspond to the three components of a living aura, those being that it has an inside, a membranous surface, and a definite outside, and thus also to the tachyon light of hyperspace outside of and surrounding our local universe, which has a lower limit of C, an upper limit of C squared, and beyond this only the event horizon of the black hole containing our expanding singularity inside a much larger and largely ineffable parent cosmos. So, metaphorically, there is the candle's flame, there is the light from the candle's flame, and there is the surrounding darkness. And these are like Ein Sof Or, Ein Sof, and Ein, respectively. What are the laws of the light listed in the omnibus? and the meanings of the attributes. The term law of the light in the context of the Atlantean constitutions of the seven chief executives refers to the law of one in Atlantis, that being that there is no law. The law of one is described as anarchy. The law of threes and the formal system or ethics of reasoning based on the six fundamental questions or so-called elements of circumstance. And these three descriptions are seen as sequentially getting further away from the original law of the light. Thus, anarchy describes the law of one, the second law is the law of threes, and the third law of the light is the six questions of logical reasoning. As to the attributes of the law of the light, there are also many titles given to it, of which four are listed in the constitutions, those being the Most High, the True Will, the Greater Light, and Hyperspace Tachyons. Can you explain the four worlds of Hakabalah? In their grossest sense, as ingredients comprising the local universe, the four worlds of Kabbalah, 
Atzaluth, Bariah, Yetzirah, and Asiah correspond to the four terrestrial elements, water, air, fire, and earth, and the four cosmological forces, gravity, electromagnetism, fission, and fusion, respectively. The elements and the forces, however, are generally understood to be intermingled in our present continuum, such that they all share space with one another. In the Four Worlds model of a Kabbalah, however, this is not the case. In the Four Worlds model, the worlds are usually depicted as concentric circles or spheres, the smallest and central of which is Asaya, and the largest and all-encompassing of which is Atzaluth. Then, attributes may be assigned to these worlds according to this schematic model. Atzaluth is the world of divine being, Bariah of divine idea, Yetzirah of divine emotion, and Asiah of divine action. Can you expand on the 22 components of Adam Kadman? There are three components of the living aura, as I mentioned, the interior, the surface, and the exterior. There are also seven chakras, or nerve clusters, along the spine and inside the brain, and 12 nerve fibers extending out from these into the organs of the torso and the extremities, the so-called chi meridians. These 22 traits combined describe the components of Adam Kadman, the archetypal prototype and template for all humans. Crowley's statement, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. What does this mean to you? I always took it as an optimistic affirmation of a basic truth. As Crowley once quipped, one canst not but do what thou wilt, as, in this sense, even willing to do nothing is an intentional act. I took it to mean this conditionally, that is, upon the sole catch of having to seek one's own highest will or the true will compelling us all. As in, if this, then that, such that if one follows the true will, then do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. This, I reason, is why the phrase proceeds shall be rather than is. It is understood that in the sober and sane situation of mundane society, one is in a condition of partial slavery, entangling alliances, responsibilities to others, and dull care prevail. However, it is reasoned by many of Crowley's modern followers, once one removes their will from within the shackles of such conventional, civilized behavior, one is set free into a higher realm of increased self-awareness through mind-expanding experiences. In other words, when what, when what one is doing is in alignment with the true will of the cosmos, one will, allegedly, have better luck at doing it, and conversely, when what one is doing is not in alignment with the true will of the cosmos, one will, allegedly, have worse luck. The proofs for and against this premise remain ongoing. Can you explain the two types of laws? In the basis of the law document, in the Atlantean constitutions, it describes how there are two types of crime. One, voluntary, that is, premeditated, a commission, 
and two, involuntary, that is, accidental, an omission, and thus, two types of law, one, actively forbidding, that is, outlawing any violation to individual rights, and two, passively allowing, that is, permitting, any violation to one's job duties. There are, therefore, four types of criminal who can come before the 13-member jury in Atlantean democracy. One who stands accused of voluntarily violating individual rights. Two, one who stands accused of accidentally violating individual rights. Three, one who stands accused of premeditated violation of someone's work and four, one who stands accused of accidentally violating someone's work. In these cases, the first may be considered guilty upon a confession. The second may be considered innocent until proven guilty. The third may be considered guilty until proven innocent, and the fourth presumed not guilty. This matrix basis for the law is an application to humanistic ethics of the same principle as applied in Pascal's wager to theological morality. In Pascal's wager, if one believes in God and there is one, they will go to heaven. But conversely, if one does not believe in God and there is one, they will go to hell. The basis of the law model applies the same concept to criminal justice. What is metaprogramming? Metaprogramming is a term coined by Timothy Leary to describe the process of rewriting one's core psychological command codes, ostensibly while under the influence of LSD or other hallucinogens. In this sense, metaprogramming oneself was the goal of psychotherapy, Freud's talking cure, but could be achieved more effectively, in Leary's opinion, on psychoactive substances. So, just as one's primary program was seen as being their acceptable routine behaviors in polite society, it was reasoned one could best alter this program or metaprogram themselves by attaining a higher vantage point from which to self-analyze. How does the orbital rearrangement of DNA work in relation to time travel? Allegedly, by combining the telomeres at the ends of DNA strands with superconductive monoatomic elements, and then running a high enough voltage current of electricity through these, one can accelerate the superconductors to relativistic speeds, causing them to disappear in a brief flash of white light. According to this premise, when these superconductive monoatomic elements are electrified in this way, they only seem to disappear to us below the speed of light, but in reality, they enter hyperspace, a realm visible exclusively above light speed. This hyperspace realm being outside of space means that it is also means that it is also beyond time and therefore eternal. So, assuming that by applying orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements to one's DNA in this manner, and then producing a large enough personal electromagnetic field charge, an individual can enter hyperspace and thus step outside of time, then theoretically they would be able to step back into time at any point along its perennial stream. Lawrence Gardner put forth this proposition, put forth the proposition that this may have happened to the person of Jesus during the crucifixion. What are monoatomic gold's effects when combined with our DNA? Allegedly, 
bonding monoatomic elements to the telomeres of one's DNA strands postpones their breaking down and thus deters the process of gradual cellular decay we associate with overall aging. There is ample evidence from written mythology and anthropological artifacts that people have long experimented with ingesting all sorts of substances in all sorts of ways, and the belief in ingesting monoatomic gold to reduce the rate of aging already has a long and storied past in this regard. However, in modern-day trials among the random individuals who have ingested monoatomic gold, there appears to be zero consensus of any permanent effect from simply eating it in powder form. In other words, there may be a precise way to prepare and ingest monoatomic elements that will provide postponed aging. However, at present, one is not known. Of course, I have never taken monoatomic gold, so I cannot recommend that anyone else should do so. Please consult a real doctor, physician, or healthcare professional before trying to bond monoatomic elements to the telomeres of your DNA. I cannot stress this point enough. Do not recreationally ingest monoatomic elements. We do not know what will happen. Can you explain future human mutations in your models and how they may come to be? In the better future timeline, I imagine, Atlantis will be established in the distant past, and time-traveling people will begin to evolve into beings of pure mental energy, or psi, contained in bodiless electromagnetic auras and able to manifest anything they wish. In the worst future timeline, I imagine, people will begin to gradually de-evolve and take on more animalistic traits and qualities, first psychologically, but ultimately behaviorally, and different animalistic factions will arise and vie for power over a cyberpunk dystopia. How do sunspot cycles affect human consciousness and drive evolution? The correlation between apparent spots on the surface of the sun and extreme weather conditions was realized long ago in China and later on in ancient Greece. <clears throat> and the subsequent study of such sunspots has proven that the absence of this phenomenon corresponds to periods of prolonged frigidity on Earth, the last period of which was called the Maunder Minimum and corresponded to the European Dark Ages. Nowadays, it is recognized the solar cycle has an 11-year bit, or base cycle, upon which much larger, longer trends are based. If one considers the Maunder Minimum as a low point or valley, and the current solar cycle as a high point or peak, for example, we can compare the low sunspot frequency period to a time of little scientific development and the high sunspot frequency present to an era of rapid technological progress. Can you explain hive think, hive mentality within the human population? Just as all humans with four brains have a collection of mammalian anterior midbrain suborgans, so too do all mammals have a collection of reptilian hindbrain suborgans, and so too do all reptiles have an insectile collection of posterior midbrain suborgans. This is only to say that, while humans have highly evolved frontal lobes, mammals have highly honed sensory centers in the midbrain, reptiles have only our own hindbrain suborgans for their whole brains, and insects only the central core suborgans. So, when there is sensory stimulation of the five senses, the mammalian mind becomes active. When there is sensory stimuli triggering a basic instinctive 
approach or retreat reflex, then the reptilian brain becomes active. And when there is sensory stimulus that challenges the most fundamental beliefs of a person, then their insectile brain becomes active. When the insectile brain is not being challenged, it functions innately, buzzing along with the hum of the crowd. This passive aspect of the insectile mind is so addicted to this hive mind state, collective consciousness or herd mentality, depending on how one looks at it, that it believes it to be God. Needless to say, this is a false belief. What are the three pillars of law? In the Atlantean constitutions, the three pillars of the law are described as an eight-unit tall baluster with a Doric base and a Corinthian pedestal, a 14-unit tall column with a Corinthian base and an Ionic pedestal, and a 27-unit tall pillar with an Ionic base and a Doric pedestal. The purpose of these three is as a place to publicly display the tabulated votes as they are being cast. The 27-unit tall pillar measures the 23 votes and three public votes that are doubled. The 14 units tall column measures the votes of the 13 jurors who preside over a trial. And the 8-unit tall baluster measures the votes of the seven chief executives. These three pillars are positioned at the vertex points of a Pythagorean triangle with legs of length th three and four and a hypotenuse of length five that is inscribed within the base 12 circumference of the lowest outermost step of the three concentrically circular steps in the center of the tiled Atlantean Senate floor. The second middle step has a circumference of seven and the central tallest smallest circular step platform has a circumference of three. Thus, the shortest, the baluster of eight, is congruent with the vertex of the Pythagorean triangle intersecting the longer leg of four and the hypotenuse of five. The middle-sized column of 14 is congruent to the intersection of the shorter leg of three and the hypotenuse of five, and the tallest column of 27 is congruent to the right angle of intersection between the two legs of lengths three and four. What is the will? In the context of the Atlantean constitutions of the seven chief executives, the individual will is defined in section 1A2A as unique independence, and in subsections to this, 1A2A1, self as utility, and 1A2A2, infinite capacity. The idea is returned to in section 2A1C, where will is defined as the utility of the self, Throughout the history of philosophy, the substance and nature of the will has been oft discussed, but rarely come to a consensus on. In ancient transference superstitions about ceremonial magic, the will of the conjurer was embodied as an avatar, a servitor, or an egregore that then went out into the world to achieve whatever magical task it had been assigned. Freud saw the will as being the same in both motor and somatosensory neurons, simply the product of a buildup within these cells of excess neurotransmitter chemicals that then cascade more than usual levels in a short spastic burst. In Freud's psychological model of the iceberg, with the subconscious superego being the portion of the iceberg above water, 
the subconscious self-awareness or ego being the portion of the iceberg below the surface of the water and the unconscious instinctive id being the depths of the water. The will was like a spine, connectively unifying all these three levels, allowing the superego to govern the ego and the ego to govern the id. And so for the id to obey the ego as the ego obeys the superego. Nietzsche had a somewhat different take on the substance and nature of the will. He described the willpower associated with free will and independent agency as the will to power and associated it with the individual's ability to survive and their desire to influence the culture and society of the world around themselves. In his Little Essays Towards Truth, entry on man, Aleister Crowley defines chia as the creative impulse or will. He also famously preached love is the law, love under will, where, by will, he claimed to mean one's own highest will that is most aligned to the greatest good of the single true will that unifies the entire cosmos. Hence, will is described in the Atlantean constitutions, also in section 2b1c, as being the higher or true will to distinguish it from pure basic hunger, which actually trumps all willpower. Can you expand on the levels of life? In the Atlantean Constitution of the Chief Executives, in the introduction to Section 2, on the three laws of life, there is a summary of the three laws as being three levels of life. In this, the first and uppermost aspect is associated with Crowley's Do What Thou Wilt edict, and with transcendent ascension in unlimited free time. The second aspect and middle is associated with the old world golden rule of harm none, lest ye be harmed, and with domestication in routine behaviors. And the third and lowest level of life is associated with hunger and with natural liberty that is driven by necessity alone. Can you explain the two laws of weights and measurements? In the Atlantean Constitution of the Chief Executives, in the section 4A, it describes the two laws of weights and measurement by the example of a scale symbolizing justice. Thus, the balanced scales symbolize fairness, while the tilted scales symbolize fraud. This description falls under the heading of economic law in the constitutions as the first category because it establishes the ethics that underlies all economic transactions. The good faith belief that the transaction is all above board and tit for tat an equal exchange between two consenting parties. Without these figurative scales symbolizing the laws of weights and measurement in economic law, there could be no fair transactions. Fraud would prevail and justice would fail. Tarot, what is its relevance in the 21st century? The 22 modern tarot trumps are said to be associated with the 22 letters of the ancient Hebrew alphabet. The constellations of attributes assigned to each trump card refer back to one letter from the old Hebrew alphabet for each. Thus, the first card in the trumps of the tarot deck, the Fool card, numbered zero, corresponds to the letter Aleph, 
in Hebrew, and thus to the magical symbol for Aleph, the horns of an ox. Moreover, in turn, this magical symbol corresponds to the hieroglyphic for the uniliteral phoneme depicting the horns of an ox in ancient Egyptian. Likewise, the first numbered trump card, the magus, corresponds to the Hebrew letter Beth and to its magical symbol of a house, which, again, in turn, corresponds to the Egyptian hieroglyphic depicting the same ideograph. While there is much modern New Age art associated with the Tarot, there is less serious scientific study of its actual origins as such. What is your higher or true will? The higher will of the self or individual is that which recognizes the greatest good is done by the self and the group, making use of one another and working together. The most high such will is the true will of God or motivating force behind all universal outcomes. Of course, this holds true only in potential and idealism, as in reality, any good universal God is apparently absent, and whoever is the most high among men is not usually also the most learned. So, demonic delusions inform the vast majority, and Satan, posing as God, has become king over human society. Thus, this demon king stands between the lesser will of the individual and the true will of God. Beware. How many psychological beings are there inside one's mind? That depends entirely on the person and may even differ case by case. Certainly, there are people who have multiple personalities, according to clinical psychology. Presumably, there are people who are demonically possessed, at least according to the Catholic Church. And there are definitely an increasing number of people with simple body dysmorphia who prefer to dissociate from reality and identify as something else. Traditionally, these have all been dealt with under one overarching premise, that hearing voices in your head is a bad thing, and that, conversely, having zero interior monologue at all must be a relatively better thing by comparison. This has been the outlook on this form of mental illness for the entire second half of the last millennium. However, before that time, hearing voices was considered a symptom of talking to God and considered a legitimate spiritual, or at the least supernatural, phenomenon. Even Joan of Arc was believed to be in communication with the one true God until she began to lose battles and was branded a witch. The drawback of this argument's contrapositive that hearing voices is therefore a good thing, is that this is true, even in potential, only part of the time. If the voices one hears are helpful, then hearing them is a good thing. But if the voices one hears are harmful, then hearing them is a bad thing. For example, if the voices in your head can assist you with solving basic arithmetic problems faster, then it would be considered a socially adaptive skill worthy of being further developed. But if the voices in your head only berate and belittle you, then their presence is considered maladaptive and not pro-socially functional thinking. So those were pairs, or rather Andrews's uh, 19 questions for uh, this particular episode of the podcast. Uh, being the 18th such episode and the fifth dealing with Pythagorean order of death material. I hope I've made it very boring so that none of you will think 
to go out and use this material in real life as if it mattered in any way or could help change the world because uh, that would probably be personally dangerous to anybody who tried to do so because the majority like the world the way it is and anyone who threatens to change the world from being that way is considered a threat to them personally as well. So look out for that uh, if anybody is even listening at all. So uh, in any event, thank you all for tuning in so much. And uh, I do appreciate your presence uh, in any form and at any time. Uh, please don't forget to uh, like, share, and subscribe, as always, to uh, uh, promote my channel and uh, help get my, uh, my ratings out of the proverbial toilet on YouTube. Um, and other than that, I don't have anything else to add. Thanks to Anders for the questions. Thanks to all of you for tuning in who might have or who might be now. So uh, have a good one, I guess. Peace. <laughs>